I'll call the September 4th Town Council meeting to order. Would you stand with me and join? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Council Roy. Here. Council Holbrook. Here. Council Sullivan. Here. Council St. Clair. Here. Council Blaze. Here. Council Benedict. Here. Chairman Alquist. Here. We have a little change of the agenda tonight uh, due to the fact that technically the, um, the public hearing has to be uh, posted with our local newspapers and the media, and that did not get done. So this is not an official public hearing tonight. It will be held at our next meeting with the second reading, which will be September 18th, I believe, at 7 o'clock. So again, this is not the official public hearing on the three items that we had listed tonight. However, we have public comment, uh, comments that we have at every council meeting. Um, everybody gets to speak for three minutes, and that goes up to a half hour. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a special guest with us who came down from Orono, and I thought maybe we would uh, let him speak a little bit. He's going to speak on the dog issue, and um, maybe that would be helpful to people to get some questions answered, and then I'll... I uh, have the general public comment where everybody will have an opportunity to speak for three minutes. So, Tom, would you introduce him, please? Yes. Uh, this evening we have Mark McCullough. Mark is, uh, I believe, a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'll let him introduce himself beyond that. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and, uh, and members of the uh, council and residents of Scarborough. My name is Mark McCullough, and I'm an endangered species biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I work up in our main field office, which is up in Orono, Maine. So I'm going to speak to you for just a few minutes this evening, and I'm um, open to answering any questions you might have about the, the dog ordinance issue. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is very appreciative that the town council is considering amendments uh, to your animal control ordinance. Uh, we all know that this summer that a piping plover was killed on one of your beaches and another piping plover was uh, killed by a dog likely in 2003. So these are unfortunate incidents. They set back our recovery of this uh, federally threatened species and the Fish and Wildlife Service hopes that we can all work together uh, to prevent any further incidents. You're all certainly aware by now that take under the, is an infraction under the Endangered Species Act, but I also wanted to just mention that all migratory birds, uh, including shorebirds and gulls um, and any birds that are found on the beach, if they um, were killed by dogs, these also are protected from take under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And so taking of any of those could be an infraction under that act as well. And also wanted to make you aware that although we've been talking a lot about the piping plover as a federally threatened species, there's another shorebird, the red knot, that migrates through Maine in late summer and early fall that visits our beaches here in Scarborough and elsewhere along the coast of Maine, and we're considering that species for federal listing as well. Since 1994, the service has had piping plover management guidelines, and as they relate to uh, pets, they're very simple, and I'll read them here. It says, pets should be leashed and under the control of their owners at all times from April 1st to August 31st on beaches where piping plovers are present or have traditionally nested. Pets should be prohibited on these beaches from April 1st through August 31st if, based on observation and experience, pet owners fail to keep their pets leashed and under control. So oh, for, we've had these uh, guidelines in effect since 1994, and for over a decade the Fish and Wildlife Service has corresponded back and forth with the town of Scarborough about uh, the dog ordinance through numerous letters and in meetings. This has been brought up numerous times um, over the last decade. And from our agency's perspective, we just have a, a, a simple message, and 
That is from decades of experience working on beaches and communities from Maine to the Carolinas. Um, our experience is that voice control of dogs just simply doesn't work. And furthermore, it's very difficult to enforce and define uh, voice control. So therefore, we've had these guidelines in place uh, requiring, or, or not requiring, but suggesting that dogs be kept on leash. So you can have dogs on the beach during the piping plover nesting season, but they should be on, on a leash. When we drafted our guidelines in 1994, there was no such thing as these retractable leashes that are, are now available. And the intent of our guidelines is to be in control of the, of the dogs. So when we read through your ordinance, we saw that the definition of a leash is having a, a leash as much as, as 30 feet. And I want to explain to you, when a little piping plover chick is approached by a dog or by people, one of the ways it defends itself is just to crouch on the beach and attempt to blend in with its surroundings. So it would be very difficult for somebody to see a piping plover 30 feet distance at the opposite side of this room, for example, especially a little chick that's is just only a, an inch or inch and a half in length. So we really feel that um, the council should also consider the length of uh, the leash, and we would encourage you to revise that definition to be about eight feet in length. That's the distance that you can be in control of the dog and be able to see a piping plover chick. And this would be easily doable and easily enforced. So we're really pleased that the council is revisiting the ordinance and um, we encourage you to pass an ordinance that would be um, in compliance with the, the guidelines that we've set out. <coughs> And finally, I just wanted to mention a bit about our recent letter that we sent to the Army Corps of Engineers concerning your project here in Scarborough to dredge the harbor and nourish Western Beach. We sent a letter to the Corps on August 20th completing our Endangered Species Act consultation with the Army Corps of Engineers. And in that letter, we spelled out um, that we needed to have beach management agreements for both Western Beach that will be receiving the sand and Ferry Beach, which is immediately adjacent to Western Beach because some of the sand from Western Beach is going to move around the point and, and accrete on Ferry Beach and also the piping plovers that are attracted to the new habitat at Western Beach will undoubtedly take their chicks over to Ferry Beach. So the good news is that we already have beach management agreements in place with uh, Prout's Neck Association for Western Beach and with the town of Scarborough. Uh, but the only outstanding issue is that the um, is this town ordinance that um, would allow dogs to be off leash at a certain uh, periods of the day. And so that's something we hope we can we can resolve here. Um, in the, in the coming weeks uh, with you. So what would happen, I guess the question that's been posed to us is what would happen um, if the ordinance is not passed? Um, we are in full anticipation that the Army Corps is going to continue to do their project. Our letter in no way says that the Corps cannot do their harbor dredging and beach nourishment projects. So. To our knowledge, they should be moving forward with their, their plans for that. If by April 1st of next year when the piping plovers return, there, there was not an appropriate ordinance in place, that would require the Army Corps to contact the Fish and Wildlife Service and reinitiate this uh, consultation process with us. And so that would be an issue between us and them. And uh, what may occur would we would do what's called, uh, prepare a document called a biological opinion, um, which would give them incidental take coverage. But we're hoping, um, and our assumption is, that there will be a, a, a suitable ordinance in place uh, to do this. So 
we, we wrote this letter uh, from the Maine field office. We review all of the federal projects that occur in Maine up in our office in Orono, as is required under the Endangered Species Act. But this particular issue raised uh, interest and concern in our regional office, our northeast regional office in Hadley, and even our headquarters in Washington. So they all reviewed the letter that we sent to the Corps and are very aware of, of um, the information and that we had in our letter uh, to the <coughs> Army Corps. So um, that's all I had to present uh, here this evening. Um, if there's any questions that you have or need any further clarification, I'd be glad uh, to try to do that in a few minutes here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, any counselors have any questions? Seeing none. Any questions quickly? If not, um, thank you. Fine. Thank you. Yep. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I, yeah, I said that, yeah? Yeah, you need to come up to the microphone and give your name and your address, please. You can ask a quick My name is Mark DeMauro. I live at 337 Pleasant Hill Road. A uh, question for Mr. Uh, McCulloch. Uh, is, do you have any evidence <coughs> at all uh, at any point in, um, in a uh, uh, reservation area that an ordinance, a dog ordinance, makes a difference, <coughs> excuse me, in the survival rate of plovers anywhere on the East Coast, let's say? Uh, my understanding is you really don't have that. And an example of that is that, <coughs> excuse me, Two dog incidents uh, in a 10-year period hardly suggests that uh, there's a, a major dog problem, given all of the other problems that you folks have very kindly listened, uh, listened to uh, over the course of several hours, uh, given all of the other potential hazards. So the question is... Uh, yeah, you asked the question, go yeah. ahead and answer it. Yeah, I'll be glad to answer that. Uh, we don't have very many pairs of piping plovers here in Maine. This year, um, our population has slowly been rebounding from a major decline that, that occurred in the last eight or ten years, and we had 44 pairs of piping plovers in the state. And so every plover counts to us. Um, everyone uh, contributes to recovery. Yes, we have piping plovers that are killed by foxes or by crows, but we have many people working together in partnership, including the, the town of Scarborough and other many, many other munici municipalities here in Maine, working together to try to, to protect the few birds that we have. And furthermore, uh, one of the, the principal protections that's provided any animal or uh, fish or a wildlife or plant that's on our federal endangered species list is they're protected from take and that's very specifically defined in the act and so when there is a, a take of a listed species that is an infraction of the endangered species act thank you uh, next question please <laughs> yeah no that's fine next question I actually have um, well qu that's fine next question um, who has the authority to, I, I have a follow-up to this after he asks, who has the authority to cite that infraction that you just had um, on either a town land or private land? Who has the authority to cite? Is it the town or is it the f federal government? The, is it our animal control officer or is it? And then, we're, then and whose property was the plover this year on when it was killed? Thank you. I also have another yeah. question. Well, no, that's fine. One apiece. Step right up. One apiece. Yeah. yeah. I really um, am not permitted to comment on the law enforcement action that's ongoing. We can't discuss open cases that are ongoing. But the Federal Endangered Species Act is enforced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we have two law enforcement agents here in Maine. Um, who help enforce um, our federal wildlife laws, and that includes the ESA and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Roy, no? Councilor Roy, we're trying to get all the questions in, Sue. Councilor Roy. The question is whether or not 
whether or not, so, so it sounds as though the U.S. Fish and Wildlife could cite somebody and they're going to possibly cite the town. Can they, wouldn't they be citing, how can they trans, how can they cite the town when it was an individual that, who, who was the taking? I guess, how do you define whether it's the town that's the problem or an individual? So we got other people want to ask questions. So yeah, and I, as I explained, sweet. I really can't I can't comment Council on Council Roy? I guess my, my question relates to the time. I, the times that you're recommending are April 1st, August 31st. And um, in a report um, that was by uh, the Maine Audubon Society, February 2013, it's 2012 Piping Clover and Lease Turn Project Report for Maine, I'm finding listings of the fact that uh, um, the plovers did not arrive on Staten Island until 514. Um, in Wells on 66, they were two PS washed out of the sea. Uh, May 15th was uh, uh, Landham Beach in Wells, um, and that they didn't arrive until May 15th. And then, in personally talking with some of our residents who frequent the beach day in and day out and walk their, their animals. Um, they indicate to me that most times the uh, plovers that they have seen haven't shown up until the third or the fourth week of April. So what is the uh, impetus behind setting that date so far back to April 1st? Uh, is, it, is it based on other evidence that's not in this report? Um, oh, okay. Well, the, the, tur turns, the, uh, the dates are those, the guideline that I read to you is for the whole East Coast. We're at the northern end of the uh, migration for the piping plover, so they get here a little later than they do uh, down, uh, let's say, in New Jersey. But with, uh, with every spring getting warmer and warmer, our piping plovers in Maine are arriving earlier and earlier. And we have had piping plovers the last couple years in Maine in March. Um, they most typically arrive sometime early to mid-April. Um, so that's why the, the April 1st date. Thanks. And is your department working on speaking with the other communities? We had a list of seven communities who had various times. Uh, most of them, the majority, were May 1st to August 31st, or one said just summer. Um, is the department working with these other communities because they would arrive in Wells before they'd arrive in Scarborough, I would think. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see if, if you've collected other um, dog ordinances for Maine, but we have these beach management agreements as we do with Scarborough with a number of other communities in Maine that have piping plovers nesting. And to our knowledge, they have all developed ordinances that are in line with uh, the guideline that I read to you. That's not the information that we received. Um, we have one, two, three, four, seven. Uh, and five of those seven are, they start June 15th, late May, late May, summer, and Memorial Day. Well, again, and that's if, if Ken you Wells, Kennebine, Biddeford, Saco, and Old Orchard. Yeah. Yeah, okay. maybe we could take a look at that together, but I'd be Thank glad you. to do that. Yep. You clarify that. Um, I can clarify that Just state who you are. And I'm Laura uh, this year I work at Maine Audubon. Um, so I wanted to clarify that those dates were for a different species, those were for least turns. Um, and so we do every March is when piping plovers are on the beach in Maine. Um, last year our first nests, we had two nests on April 18th, or April 18th. Birds started to arrive, um, or birds were started nesting activity in early April. So. Um, and I also, but I wanted to clarify, so um, for a lot of those, it's, it's hard to succinctly summarize all the different municipal rules, um, but in most cases, there's a, or many of those cases that you're reading, like in May, for example, um, Town of Wells, for example, April 15th, I believe, is when the leash law activates but there's not the restricted hours until June, because most of the restricted hours that we see in Binniford and Kennebunkport, um, those restricted hours are, are largely in reference to people and keeping dogs off the beach when there's people on the beach. But the, typically, there are leash laws on many of them year-round, um, and many of the leash laws start earlier 
than the dog restricted hours are. Does that make sense? If, if I could clarify, however, the, I'm reading under the subtitle Site Summaries for Piping Plovers. Sorry, that was a typo. I, Let me see. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, and the report is on plovers in turn. Yeah. While they're looking at that, I wonder if I could just ask a follow up for the you council's can. benefit to Mark on the issue of timing. Your guidelines talk about August 31. Um, as the end of the nesting period. Um, this council, I think, has received other information from uh, inland fisheries and wildlife at the state level that September 15th is the advisable end date of the nesting period, and in fact, that's what's before the council as we speak. I, I think they would benefit from uh, hearing what that ap appropriate date is from your opinion. From a, from a piping plover perspective and the guidelines that the Fish and Wildlife Service has, August 31st is, is adequate to meet our guidelines. There are probably many other reasons why you might want to extend that later, um, one of them being the potential listing of the red knot, which could be present into mid-September. But many other shorebirds are present until the middle of September. By then, um, most of their migration has been completed. So I believe Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, has been uh, promoting a date of, of September 15th. And we would encourage that as well if you, you felt that you wanted to go that far. But from the piping plover perspective, August 31st is as far as, as our guidelines would suggest. And that would satisfy the condition that right. is associated. OK, thank yeah. you. Thank you. So can I be clear on something? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, well, hold on. Councilor Holbrook. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I missed it. Um, I know you said the end to satisfy um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the um, recommended at the end was the August 31st date. Correct. I, I missed what the beginning date was for April 1st. April 1st. Right. Yeah. No, I just I wanted some clarification on that. I just feel like <laughs> just I'm frustrated. I feel like every time I turn around, it's we're like including another bird or we're extending it to this, and I just I want a straight direct guideline for exactly what birds we need to be covering. I, I just impress I feel frustrated. Sure, thank sure you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. We're running out of time. We have other people. I'll be quick and I think yep. mine's pretty easy. Um, Katie Foley, three Lucky Lane, Scarborough, Maine. Um, just curious, do you have a date or do you know when exactly the consultation began uh, with the Army Corps and when the town was made, first made uh, aware that the amendment was going to be na made in order to approve the dredge? I'll, I'll let Tom answer that. I, I can just answer the end date um, in terms of when we received notice. That was August 20th, not, not when it began. And, and Tom, we had meetings uh, with the Corps starting, it's in our letter, but I think it was about April or so of, of last year. I think we received a letter from the Corps initiating the endangered species consultation in May sometime for Scarborough, but we can check on those dates. Yeah, forgive me, I wasn't okay. party to those conversations, but I, I can say definitively we did not receive notice until uh, August 20. When we copied you on our, our letter, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter, uh, to be clear, I think you and I spoke uh, 515 the night before, so I had some sense in my personal conversation with Mark that that was the first notice. Thank you. It's the night before the council meeting. Um, yep. <coughs> Name and address, please. Name, Jim Rinkle, address, 6 Morning Street. <coughs> um, I'd like to ask, how does Ferry Beach um, rank as plover habitat? Good, bad, and different. And when was the last time uh, there was nesting at Ferry Beach or Western Beach? Mm -hmm. um, Ferry Beach has had no records of piping plovers nesting on it since Maine Audubon began monitoring in 1981. But its conditions are improving. Um, you can go to the Maine Geological Survey's website and look at uh, the conditions of all of our Maine beaches, whether they're eroding or accreting being added to it. <coughs> and Ferry Beach is growing, um, and, and geologists believe that's because of the sand that was put on Western Beach rounding the corner and, uh, and helping to grow Ferry Beach. 
So we think that the habitat's improving at Ferry Beach for piping plovers and that they could indeed nest there in the next couple years. It's been uh, at least two or three years since we've had nesting of piping plovers at Western Beach because the beach has eroded so severely and the habitat is not there. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, go ahead. No, you're up. Apologies for coming in late, so this may have been answered. Uh, Liam Summers from Holmes Road in Scarborough. We use the, the beach quite a bit. In fact, we moved to Scarborough specifically for the access to the beaches because we enjoy them uh, so greatly. Um, my question is, in the time that the piping plovers have been nesting in Pine Point, how many have been injured by uh, a dog uh, in relation to how many dogs are on the beach? And uh, in the case of the uh, one that was killed recently, what sanctions was, were brought uh, upon the person who did not have their dog under control that began this, uh, this session that we're here today for? Um, did there, was there anything that was done to, uh, to that person as a penalty? And would that have rectified this? Thank you. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service knows of two piping plovers uh, that have been killed on Pine Point Beach by dogs. One uh, in 2003, our law enforcement agent investigated that. It was an adult piping plover with eggs just about to hatch and very likely they, they feel was killed by a dog. And then, of course, um, the chick that was killed this year. So that's all that we know about um, our two incidents. And as I, I said earlier, you might have missed it. As far as the current law enforcement case, I, I can't comment on that this evening. Thank, thank you. Council Benedict? Yes. <coughs> I have a question for you. Uh, the council is here to work for the people and with the people, and this whole thing has obviously created a little turmoil because there's a lack of understanding. However, one thing that I am 100% sure of is there was a young lady here, I believe from the Fish and Wildlife, who quoted, in the last five years, that she had identification that the plovers were on all our beaches. And now your information goes back to 1980-something or 90-something saying there have been no plovers. Now when things like this happen, it puts us in a real crunch because this is not a, a, a personal matter on my end. It's representing the people and the council. But if we get two different sets of information, it makes it real difficult because if I caught it, someone else is going to catch it and I'm going to hear about it in my email tomorrow. Yeah, what I, I think the best source of information that we all have is this report um, that Councillor Roy was talking about. Um, the, the main Audubon Piping Plover Report has a table in there that's been kept ever since they began uh, monitoring piping plovers in 1981. Actually, and it starts in 77. 77, okay. So well, you can look at that, and, and most of the beaches in, in Scarborough uh, should be on that, in that table. And Tom and I were talking about this today, whether we knew of any portions of beaches or certain beaches in Scarborough other than Ferry Beach that I just mentioned um, that, doesn't, that hasn't had nesting piping plovers on it. So um, we can check that report. We can also check the data that we in Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife have and, and get back to the council with, with the best available information um, that, that we have. We'd be glad to Thank do you. that. Just step right up if you're going to speak to clarify that. The, con the confusion is about Western Ferry. So Western Ferry, we um, consider essentially one beach. So when I say, so it was probably me because on Western and Ferry, we consider one beach and there were nesting, there was a nesting pair in 2009, there was a nesting pair um, in 2008. 
there was a nesting pair in 2007. You um, made that presentation at our ordinance meeting. It wasn't a, so that's why. So, Correct. so that's, so there, so looking at, oh, so when, when we were talking about the four, there were always piping plovers on all four beaches. That's in regards to Ferry Western, Pine Point, Scarborough, and, um, and, and Higgins Beach. There have been nesting plovers. There have not been, as Mark mentioned, nesting activity on the ferry side of Ferry Western Beach um, in, in our records. But there is, has been recent nesting records on the western end. And as Mark has pointed out, they're very mobile. So um, it's, it's very possible for a nesting pair on western to just to cross the bend and end up on Ferry Beach. So that's, that just might hopefully at least clarify a little bit. Thank you. I will share this report. I just received this report tonight from Charlie Maynard, who is a person who walks the beach regularly with his little Maltese. And uh, I'll, I'll share Thank some you. of this data. Yep. One more question. We're running out of time here. Go ahead. I, I don't want to cut you off. So both of you guys, can, you can go after. Thank you. Ann Robinson. Portland, Maine. I was actually a little confused by Mr. McCullough's statement because I thought I heard him say that the leash um, restriction is not required but suggested. And I guess the corollary to that is he's been referring to guidelines in a, you know, in a guidance document. So I would ask, is it a guidance document or is it a promulgated rule? Because obviously there's a difference between something that has you know, the, the um, force of law and something that doesn't. So I would appreciate clarification on that point. Thank you. And, 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 and to Council Benedict's, um, Councilman Benedict's question, I, I, I still don't really think that's been answered because with all due respect, you know, Maine Audubon is not an agency of state or federal government. And so I think the question is, you know, has U.S. Fish and Wildlife independently verified data and determined what data it considers to be reliable upon which it then bases its guidelines or rules. Thank you. Thank you. Try to answer that. Though. So what I referred to were the piping plover guidelines. They are guidelines. They're not promulgated in any federal rule. They're not a federal law of any type. They're just guidelines. And as far as the data that we collect on piping plovers here in Maine annually, this is really important information to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and to Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So we work very closely with Maine Audubon and any other partners that we have who are monitoring our beaches. Um, our staffs are out there with them almost on a daily basis. Um, all of the nesting locations are confirmed by both the state and federal fish and wildlife agency um, so that all of the data that are in that report for many, many years, we've worked very, very closely with Audubon. And much of the data is also collected by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and inland fisheries and wildlife biologists as well. So um, it's, it's as accurate information as we can possibly get for the state of Maine. Thank you. A person sitting down, last question on this. Thank you. Kasha Conkley, 18 Fowler Farm Road. Um, my question is, it seems like there's a lot of data gathering and um, they found out that the plovers are on this beach one year and on another beach another year. Why don't we just go out at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the season, March, mm -hmm. figure out where they are and if they're at one beach, close off that side of the beach only for everybody dogs, kids, because I think it was the last meeting, it said that the plover is something that, you know, when it gets scared, it just stands still. It makes no sense to me that dogs are the focal point here when children could be running around squashing them too. So let's just figure out where they are each year and close that side of the beach and leave the rest of the beaches alone. It just seems like a more measured, targeted approach than just a blanket approach. Thank you. And we'll take uh, other general, please. No applause. Please. 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 No applause. We'll take other general comments. Uh, gentlemen on the end, you wanted to make a comment about something different? Go ahead. Yep, this is. Dobre vecherum. Men yasafut Dennis Marat. Good evening. My name is Dennis Marat. I'm from Westbrook. 
That was a little bit of my uh, Russian language over the last 20, 20 years. Um, I'm a vice co-chair of the Greater Portland, Maine, Archangel Russia Sister City Exchange, which started in November 1988 when the first delegation from Greater Portland, led by then Mayor Phil Spiller from Westbrook, was invited to that subarctic seaport in northwestern Russia for the first time. Prior to that, that city was a closed city. <clears throat> um, November 18th, coming up, Westbrook Middle School will be the location of a 25th anniversary celebration of this amazing accomplishment over the last 25 years. There's a hundred sister city pairings in both countries, and Portland, Maine, and there's 14 communities, including the city of Portland. And Archangel has been one of the most successful and one of the most uh, longest accomplished sister city pairings. I have a uh, collection of uh, summer newsletter and invitations to the town council members, which I was asked to present to uh, Tody Justice this evening. Um, there's going to be quite a few things going on that day, starting at 3.30, until we hope 5.30. <clears throat> We've got a lot to do in two hours. Um, a couple thoughts. We've had, when those agreements were signed 25 years ago, one of the keys of that was high school and university students, like the young people, the future generations. We ran a high school exchange from 89 to 99 for 10 years, every March, April, simultaneous, with home stays and students were selected through credit process. It was all volunteer. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We uh, are reviving the high school exchange over the last two years with Portland and one of the high schools in that city based on economic, oh, excuse me, environmental and ecological issues. And it was interesting just listening to this discussion here tonight because uh, they're a coastal seaport and I'm sure they have similar problems with endangered wildlife issues. We've had legal exchanges, highway engineering exchanges, the classical, the Portland String Quartet went there in 1992. Um, photography club exchanges are what I got involved in. We're looking at the next 25 years as a key part of continuing this amazing exchange uh, with new people, uh, young people, leaders of communities. Uh, so we'd invite anyone that can make it, or the whole council would be great. There's going to be people there, we hope, from Wyndham, Scarborough, Portland, South Portland, Westbrook, Brunswick, Freeport, Yarmouth, Gorham, Great New Gloucester, and Long Island, depending on the weather that day. So, um, just a couple. <coughs> this this was the original orphanage in November 1992. I have a friend from Winthrop that was in the teddy bear design business, and she's been very successful. These were donated, and um, that's 1992, 21 years ago. I'd be very curious where these two little guys are today. They were just waking up after their lunch afternoon nap, and they had this little surprise there. Um, I've just been amazed at what's happened in the last 25 years, and uh, I hope it continues for 50 more. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other general comments tonight before we move on? Are we in general comments now? We're in, we, were, we have been in general comments. I thought we could 30 minutes, so. Huh? Okay. I didn't know I thought it was a half hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Close the public comment, and then we'll. Is this the. Hi, Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I applaud the United States Fish and Wildlife for doing their job assisting the plover in its recovery. After all, they are the federal agency charged with protecting endangered species. 
I personally would like to point out, however, that the town of Scarborough also has a job to do, and frankly, they're, they're doing a pretty good job. They're really trying hard. It's true that Scarborough is not enforcing their dog ordinance, but the town is doing a very good job in protecting habitat. Scarborough has approved bonds of over $5 million to help protect critical habitat for all sorts of migratory shorebirds and other wildlife, purchasing over 900 acres almost over 900 acres with taxpayer dollars in the last 10 years. Taxpayer dollars, much of it in the headwaters of the Scarborough Marsh along the Nonsuch River, which feeds plover habitat and which shorebirds, many shorebirds feed. As a member of the fastest growing town in Maine, I suggest that instead of bullying the town, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Audubon, and IF&W should be applauding the town for the way they have balanced their severe residential growth with conservation. It is the balancing of resources and needs that the town councilors have as their job, and it is that balance that I want to emphasize. The data says that tidal surges, rising sea levels due to climate change, and erosion are the number one threats to the sandy beach nesting sites of the plover. However, there are a lot more threats that are not beyond our control. The work that the town has done thus far could be called a grand compromise. They had to balance economic value of beaches, the demands for recreation and conservation of habitats. The needs of the surfers had to be balanced with the desires of the residents. Regarding direct threats to plovers, building seawalls is a known cause of adding to beach erosion. Yet the town and the federal government allow seawalls all over this town to protect private property. There's a whole list of activities that are currently allowed on our beaches that threaten the plovers, perhaps even more than dogs. Kite flying, fireworks, sand raking, sand surfing, horseback riding, skimboarding, runoff, seawalls, and people. Only two dogs in 11 years have been implicated in harming a plover, but we're being bullied into changing our ordinance. And we, and I'm saying we as the town and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we, we allow Prout's Neck Golf Course to use herbicides and pesticides that run off into the habitat where plovers feed. Perhaps that's why the birds aren't having successful nests. We allow Old Orchard Beach to light fireworks off every Thursday night in the summer time. My dogs shake when we hear them. We allow beach rakes to scoop up the rack from the beach, which eliminates a food source for plovers. Beach rack raking, in fact, could be the reason plovers abandon their nests to look for food. We can control many activities that cause plover nesting difficulty, but we allow some activities for balance because that is our job. Now let's review. 12% of the time, dogs are allowed off-leash. On one of our beaches, 0%, Scarborough Beach. Wrap it up. That is a balance. That is a compromise. And that is the town of Scarborough doing their job. Thank you. Well, uh, please, please no. um, close the public comment session, uh, section of this meeting. Next item on the agenda is the minutes from the August 21st meeting, regular meeting. Is there a motion to accept? Move approval. Second. Any errors or omissions? If not, all those in favor? It's a vote. Uh, item six, adjustments to the agenda. Are there any? There are none at this time. Item seven, items to be signed. We'll do that throughout the meeting. Council Alfred, could we just pause for a moment? We will. People, people want to leave? Thank Mr. McCullough for being here. And, yeah, uh, thanks. And I yep, I thank you for coming too, also. And just, I appreciate just your time. to you. That's what, the only phrase I know in Russian. No, it's not being rude if you leave. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, old business, order number 1341 is the second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to update the zoning districts that apply to, the town, uh, to Scarborough Downs property and adjacent property to the city of Maine. Yeah. Uh, we're under order 1341. Maybe we need to close the doors. Yeah, I think it's the back. Dan Baker, Bacon, our town planner, is here tonight, and he'll give us an outline on this item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dan Bacon, town planner. Uh, this item on your agenda is, is really the companion piece to your action at the last meeting when the council considered and approved at second reading the new crossroads district that applies to 
um, that is to apply to the Scarborough Downs property. Um, this map on the screen illustrates um, the zoning map amendment. Um, in orange is the proposed boundaries for the new Crossroads District that was adopted at your last <coughs> meeting. Um, that would apply the Crossroads District to the majority of the Downs property. Um, this zoning map change also designates an area to the east of the Scarborough Downs property as a village residential four district. Um, these are four right now landlocked properties accessible really only either through the Downs or from parcels along Sawyer Road. Um, and this zoning district for those properties would be consistent with the residential zoning along Sawyer Road. And the map change also designates um, the Payne Road corridor from really the Ginn Road area um, near Exit 42 um, up to uh, the Nunsuch River and where you enter into uh, the sort of the, the area with Shaw's, Sam's Club, um, the Eight Corners area, um, the Sc Scarborough Gallery area into a B3 district. Um, this map change also takes um, an area right now that's in resource protection, out of resource protection, because it was discovered that the wetlands in that area don't qualify for resource <coughs> protection um, and designates that as part of the Crossroads um, Development District. Um, so again, this really uh, was intended to go along with your action at the last meeting and uh, applies that district to be approved um, to the Scarborough Downs property. And, and this is the second reading, and we've had public hearings on this in the past. So is there anybody from the public who would like to speak on this matter? Step right up to the microphone, state your name and address. Um, Abby Ordway, 11 Burnhamwood Circle. Um, it's my understanding with, within the content of this ordinance is that casinos will be possibly allowed um, to be built within the zoning, am I am I incorrect? Or correct? I'm sorry. <coughs> At the last council meeting, there was um, an amendment made to the district that would allow for uh, casino gambling, but subject to local voter approval um, here in Scarborough, and also requiring um, state law amendments to allow casino gambling at this location and subject to a license agreement that would be both with the state and the community. So, yes, with some conditions. But just to be clear, what's before council, this order uh, has to do with the, the zoning map change. The text substantive changes have already been approved by council at their last meeting. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the lead of Councillor St. Clair. Can I ask for just a clear definition being that if me as a voter um, wants to sums up or sums down the building of a casino within this zoning district, will I have that ability to do that? Yes. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. <coughs> Any questions from the council? Uh, motion. We need a motion. We need a motion. Move approval of order number 13-41. Second. Second. Any more comments? Any other comments? If not, those, all those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Next order. Order number 1365 is act to approve the appointment of Rachel Hendrick Hendrickson to the Parks and Conservation Land Board as recommended by the Appointments Committee. The Appointments Committee is uh, Council Holbrook is the head of that. So would you like to make that motion? Oh, uh, move approval of order number 13-65. Second. Any comments? Thank you for... Seeing Perfect. none, all those in favor? Opposed, it's vote. Under new business order number 1354 is a first reading and referred to the planning board. The proposed amendments to chapter 405 of the town of Scarborough zoning ordinance with regards to the T&D overlay district relating to density factors and density bonuses. This is tabled from the June 19th town council meeting. I made a recommendation to you and I'll verbalize that just now. Uh, this matter, I believe, was tabled back on July 9th, excuse me, June 19th, and I, as I recall, the reason for that, and Councillor Holbrook, I think, offered that motion so she can certainly clarify, was to allow the Affordable Housing Alliance to review the proposed changes and provide input to Council 
Uh, they've not been able to do that yet. In fact, they're meeting tomorrow night. Uh -huh. So I would suggest you table this matter yet again yeah. and to allow enough time for them to do their work and make recommendation. Um, okay. I'm trying to see which date I suggest. Well, we, we probably ought to table more than one meeting in case Correct. there's mm -hmm. some questions that need to be answered. I was suggesting the October 16 meeting that will allow enough time for review and input. I'll, I'll move, can, move that, if I may. The October 16? Table yeah. Second. Move the table that until. Second. 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 All those in favor? Opposed? I might add a little comment to that. Um, they, as you, as he mentioned, uh, Tom mentioned that they do meet tomorrow, and that meeting is with um, Mr. Anderson mm -hmm. um, to review that district and the um, density bonus. What time? Um, that's. Thursday, September 5th at 6.30. And so they'll be meeting with Carrie Anderson and then discussion to follow <coughs> on the um, density bonus. Okay, thank you. Next order. Order number 1366 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, the Town Council Rules and Policies, Section 204, under other committees and boards. I could, uh, this, uh, this is a, a fairly simple amendment that comes uh, by way of the Rules and Policies Committee. Uh, forgive me, I don't have the text in front of me, but as I recall, it effectively requires, uh, it sounds like Councilor uh, yes, Roy it. has it in front of her. Yeah, it's, uh, it says that the Town Council shall conduct an annual review of all committees and boards and other than standing committees of the Council to ensure that there is still a valid need for such committees slash boards and the workshop shall be held within the first quarter of the year. Because we we thought in the committee that you know we establish a lot of committees and sometimes their work is completed and they they really have no major reason to meet and so we wanted to make sure that we looked at their annual reports we looked at what they were doing and said yay or nay whether they continue and and uh, move on from there. So this is. The First reading. Hmm? This is the first reading and scheduled public hearing for September 18th. Right. So moved. Second. 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 Any questions, <laughs> comments? All those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Order number 1367 is act to adopt 2013-2014 school budget resolutions which are required by state statutes. I'll turn it over to Tom. As the title suggests, uh, with the voters approving the school budget uh, for the third time, as I recall, uh, we are now required to put it in such a form that uh, complies with state statute. Uh, councils passed these sorts of resolutions in the past. It certainly doesn't approve any different amounts than were approved by the voters uh, at the last election. Motion? The question? Second. Thank you. Comments? Any comments from anybody? If not, all those in favor? Mm -hmm. Opposed? It's a vote. Non-action items are none. Mm -hmm. And the standing and special committee reports. Council Roy. Um, Finance Committee, we met on the 23rd of July the last time. We will be meeting September 10th and then October 1st, 8th and 22nd. And we'll be meeting and having an open forum with some of the major municipal departments just to, um, what our purpose is, is to do an overview of the services provided by these departments and discuss ways in which perhaps they might be adjusted to, you know, to reduce the um, next year's budget. So we wanted to kind of get, get a handle on some of the things prior to the fact that uh, most municipal departments begin developing their next year's budget come November. And so we wanted to, you know, just really uh, brainstorm with them and see if we can uh, uh, come up with some innovative suggestions. Um, uh, GOP COG, uh, I think there's an upcoming steering committee. I'm not sure just when, and PAX is one, some coming up shortly. SEDCO's next board meeting is tomorrow morning at 7.30. Um, and then the annual meeting for SEDCO is October 8th at 5 p.m. at the Black Point Inn. And you probably all have gotten the invitation via email, and you can reply back using that um, event, I think it's event time uh, program 
and uh, council, um, there's no charge for council to attend that, and uh, we encourage them. Um, Energy Committee's meeting on the 18th of uh, September. Uh, I presume, uh, we, I haven't seen any agenda yet, but it's a little early. Long Range Planning Committee um, ha ha is having its next meeting on the 13th of uh, September. And we're going to be looking at, um, I erased most of this stuff, but um, has to do with something, some things with beaches and historic preservation and just a, a group of things where we wanted to uh, um, take a stance and make some suggestions. And I think those are all the committees. So the meetings have been slowed down for the summer, but they're coming back. That's all, but thank you. Um, as we talked about a little bit before, Housing Alliance will be meeting tomorrow evening, which is September 5th at 6.30. Um, just again, a quick recap. We'll be meeting with the developer, Candy and Carrie Anderson from KDA, um, with you know to have discussions about um, the zone change for the T&D district, as well as a discussion on that. Historic Preservation will be meeting Tuesday, September 10th at 6.30. Um, the two main agenda items will be um, to develop the screening process for um, identifying historic properties and resources, as well as discussion on a proposal that came to them through uh, Long Range Planning Committee, and that contained um, some potential language for an ordinance that would help encourage the preservation of properties um, through the site plan review process and, and subdivision process. Um, the next one was Conservation Commission. They met Monday, April, uh, August 12th. I was unable to make that, um, but it was a site walk. Um, they're continuing the process of visiting each of the town properties so that they can come forward with recommendations of possible uses. Um, the last site walk was a um, 120-acre parcel of town-owned property located off of Woodspell Road, which is kind of near the Scarborough Connector. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Um, I don't really have a lot to report. Uh, I just uh, welcome Jim back to Maine. Mm -hmm. hey. And now maybe we can finally have an ordinance committee meeting. He doesn't want to hold it with just so, um, Oh, you're still going. <laughs> yeah. So, um, actually, uh, Jim just arrived home today, was it, or yesterday? Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday night. Well. Wow. So uh, we will be getting a date together um, to look at cell phone towers. And uh, as far as transportation committee, I have nothing to report on that. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Kate. Oh, nope, I don't have any tonight. Thank you. Oh, none, Councilor Kate. The only thing that I have uh, is the Shellfish Conservation Commission will be meeting next Tuesday discussing things going on at the waterfront, and that's all I have. Okay. I have uh, Eco May next week. I believe it's the 12th, so that'll be our regular meeting at that time. Uh, Councillor, uh, town manager's report. Yes, thank you. Um, just a brief update on the dredge project. Uh, this morning there was a pre-bid meeting held uh, down at Pine Point Co-op. Uh, the schedule is as follows. Uh, they're looking to open bid September 23rd with the award to be sometime in mid-October. That will put us in position uh, theoretically to have uh, the dredge accomplished this year, uh, failing any other issues that may uh, intervene. Uh, they expect it's going to be between a two to three month uh, process once they mobilize on site. Um, and they're expected to move about 115,000 cubic yards of material. And the good news is they expect to be able to accomplish both channel dredging and the anchorage areas, which is, is key. Um, I had a conversation, uh, a series of conversations with Councilor Sullivan regarding uh, the potential for us to employ that contractor to do additional dredge work uh, beyond the federal scope, if you will. And I think it'll be important for us to understand what the pricing is um, as to whether or not we can accomplish anything beyond what the Army Corps is planning on doing already. Uh, also, by way of update, uh, we are moving very quickly to try to accomplish all of our construction projects this fall. Uh, we are on track, although it is a very tight construction timeline, 
to accomplish the sidewalk on Black Point Road this fall, uh, as well as the improved crossings of the Eastern Trail at both Black Point Road and Pine Point Road. And finally, there is a sidewalk section on Pine Point Road extending down to Dunstan Landing Road from the new intersection that will certainly be done. We've contracted with Grondon, uh, who did all the other associated work at the intersection. Um, so I'll keep you apprised as the fall proceeds, but uh, here and now we are on task to get that done before the snow flies. Uh, two other quick things. Um, the town um, is in receipt of a, a very detailed report prepared by the Maine Revenue Service. This, was, this report is the product of a number of requests made from Scarborough residents and taxpayers regarding the town's assessment practices. So uh, I'm pleased to have received the full detailed report. I've provided that, uh, copies of that, at least electronically, to members of council. Um, so we as a staff are, are, are pleased that Maine Revenue took um, the request seriously and did a thorough review and provided that report back to us for our use. And lastly, on a lighter note, um, Scarborough seems to be a have been found. We have two different TV shows that are interested in shooting episodes uh, using parts of Scarborough. Interestingly, our beaches is what they're interested in. Uh, I'm not familiar with either of these shows previous to this, but one is called Born to Explore. Uh, and apparently, um, the premise of the show, uh, the, the host, who's a, a bit of a traveler, um, uh, explorer, if you will, uh, has kind of a human interest component to uh, be the hook to the show. and um, I don't know the exact circumstances, but it, apparently there's a handicapped dog that uses a wheelchair on Pine you know Point. It? I know the story. Well, that's uh, that's apparently the draw that brings the show here, and then uh, while they're here, they'll shoot the episode, including including a traditional lobster bake and those sorts of things. The other show is called Trip Flip. It's on the Travel Channel. Uh, again, I don't know much about it, but they're interested in coming here and, and shooting an episode. So uh, we're working through community services. Um, also, the main office of tourism has been involved in um, providing accommodations and those sorts of things. So as the details um, begin to be clearer, I'll certainly share that with you. But I thought that was an interesting development, both happening in the last week or so. Um, so I'm available for questions if you have any. I have a question. Um, <coughs> we're going back to dogs on the beach, but um, Mark McCullough said, uh, certainly, the Army Corps can proceed without anything in place. A that's what I heard. I heard that too. As long as it's in place by April 1st, 2014. Correct. That's what I heard. Is that is that correct? Uh, that's what uh, the representative from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said mm -hmm. to you this evening. What I what I will tell you, what I know from the Army Corps' perspective, mm -hmm. is they don't want. To. Well, they're they're a bit hesitant. Uh, they right. have employed legal services in-house legal services to review, and uh, there's no question they would love the comfort and assurance of having the council take definitive action that would comply. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a specific answer in writing that they will not proceed, mm -hmm. but I, I do know that the dredge process is highly regulated. There's only a certain time of year that we can do this, and I'm tickled that we're able to secure federal financing or funding to do this in the first place, and frankly, delays I fear will uh, could jeopardize that. This is my own opinion in that regard. Uh, uh, I mean, I kind I of knew, knew the answer to that, but I just wanted for any public listening. I think you heard a technical and legal answer. I think there are some practical issues that need to be considered as part of the Correct. equation. Okay. Well, I just don't want to. Oh, is it all right if I speak? All right, sure. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, I was going to save this for my closing comments. However, um, I feel um, that the Army Corps um, takes us very seriously. And here's what they wrote. The Corps issued a solicitation for bids for the dredging contract last Friday the 23rd and is planning on opening bids on or about September 23rd, having the subject animal control ordinance passed by the town prior to October 11th would allow the Corps to award the dredging contract and keep the dredging project on schedule. I just that sounds to, to me like they take that. the... Uh, the U.S. Fish and Game, at their word, and they take it very seriously. Um, I don't think we got a very clear answer as to guidelines versus law, but however, um, from this, what I'm in, I'm sure that Army Corps 
that has consulted legal and does know Section 7, and I think they're taking this very seriously, and I definitely don't want to lose the dredge, and there's uh, plenty of fishermen and boaters down the Pine Point and Ferry Beach that don't want to see this dredge loss, so I take it very seriously, and I think they do too. Thank Can you. I say something? Yeah. Sure. I, 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 I don't want to lose the dredge either. I just I'm, I find myself getting more and more frustrated by the confusion of information that we keep getting. And I think I, I personally feel like it makes me look bad when I'm getting different responses to the same questions that we keep asking. We're getting different guidelines. We're adding birds. We're, I just it's frustrating to me. And I get that. Is it bothersome to anybody that? We're sort of being held by this with this dredge project. It puts I feel like it personally puts us in a diff, very difficult position. I think what Tom and I have tried to do, and we did again today, is try to sift through this and talk to different parties. And, we, and, and Tom's trying to put some reasoning to this together Absolutely. so we can make it clear for us as counselors. And he's trying to put a little package together. And in as of this afternoon you were doing that, you know, right. trying to figure it out. So I think it might take, I don't want to say we're stalling anything, but it might take a little time to try to figure out yeah, who's I, on first. And, and I'm clearly not, I, I'm not, personally, I don't think it's, it was our responsibility to come up with a lot of these facts, that we've asked for these facts from right. people. So I'm certainly not putting any pressure. I, the work that Tom has already put into this is overwhelming to me. But I just feel like, Again, tonight, I feel like we didn't get a right. straight answer. So what we're talking about is the core talking to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife right. about it. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. You know what? As of today, we figured out they haven't been talking to each other. Tom made it's it very so clear this afternoon in his office when we were on speakerphone that they need to talk to each other so we have somewhere to go. Or we have, you know, we have some guidance here. So at the end of the day, they're not the ones that are going to look bad. We look bad. I understand that. And, and, and so I think, I know, he made it very clear to them that we didn't an answer on this and it needs to be clarified. Is that correct, Tom? I that's think true. that's what we talked yeah, about. It was, I was frankly it's shocked to right. hear that uh, U.S. Right. Fish and Wildlife and Army Corps had not spoken since they issued this okay. concurrence with conditions. Yeah. Yep. And I think, I think if we look at, I think everybody got a copy of that um, video from Cape Hatteras. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at some of those situations that, that happened, and it wasn't only dogs that got affected, it was wildlife as a, and, and as a whole. So, I mean, I think, you know, certainly I agree with, um, you know, following federal guidelines, but I, I want the clear answers. And, I mean, they're just the numbers, you know, that, I mean, and when do they actually come are not, is not clear information to me. So, um, Thank you, Councilor Benedict. Um, the, the, the question that I have, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, is I was a little bit floored when, I don't remember, one of the ladies out there asked the question, is this law or is this a recommendation or is whatever, and I heard the words, it's not a law. It's guidelines. And I guess as a citizen, I'd like to know this conversation about a twenty-five to $50,000 fine, if it's not a law, hmm. how can they uh, right. well, uh, put us in a fine situation? I'll clarify that. Two yeah, there's right. two <laughs> separate issues. Um, guidelines are, are just that. They, they're not promulgated rules. They're not force of law. And that's what he referred to, and I can provide, provide copies. It's, they are suggesting that we comply with their guidelines, which are advisory. That's different than the official Federal Endangered Species Act, which does have the force of law. And there are fines and penalties depending on uh, infractions of that, of that federal law. So there are two different things there, and I appreciate it can be confusing. Well, does that act specify what should be done to protect them? Are they in agreement? <laughs> uh, I, I would say the guidelines support, uh, support the act. He used the term take, and that is a, a, a very specific and particular word in the Federal Endangered Species Act. And what he said quite clearly tonight is the, the act of the take um, is something that is viewed as an infraction under the law, and there's the potential for violation, fines, and penalties. 
have not gone on to say who they're going to enforce that against. Uh, that's certainly a, a looming question. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Do we do we have the information? Have we been provided the information of the law itself, the Endangered Species Law, and what it specifically says? Mm -hmm. I don't believe I've provided to you, but I'm pleased to do that. Um, I the see Judy. I see Judy holding her hand like it's that. It's probably that's that thick. Yeah, it's yeah. Exactly. quite voluminous. Um, <laughs> the guidelines I can provide a fairly good and understandable overview, and I did provide that document mm -hmm. to you. I can do that again. I might suggest you start there, uh, because I think when you're looking at federal statutes, you're correct. looking at probably mountains of information. That's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I looked it up. It's very, very lengthy, mm -hmm. and it's hard to understand. Okay. okay. So if the guidelines huh. support the the act, that's what we should be shooting towards, right? And that's what the condition requires us to do, is to comply with their guidelines. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Holbrook. Um, I just had two, um, well, I had two questions for Tom, um, and I think one of them just got clarified. If the guidelines that they're speaking to have reference to our project, and then the possible take fines, fees, and penalties are in reference to when an incident occurs, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, my uh, yes to the second half of the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, restate the first one, please. The, when we're discussing guidelines as far as um, what we do or do not implement out of their guidelines, mm -hmm. it is we're talking in um, relationship to our dredge project. Correct. Correct. The conditions for our dredge project. These guidelines were were yeah. published and still bear the date of 1994, so okay. they are quite old. And what was referred to this evening is that they apply to the entire eastern seaboard, um, which is uh, so they're they're a bit dated and a bit broad, obviously, because they apply to a large geographic area. Uh, my only my my original question, <laughs> um, if I'm not mistaken, um, and, and maybe you can help. Me to understand this. The last I had heard, um, as far as the Scarborough River goes, and, and being an important project that might need to really be executed now, um, is that it is quite full at this point, as far as the sand buildup. And at this point, I heard a rumor that the boats are already scraping as they're trying to go out. Um, so this is not a project that could be forestalled for another year? No, no there isn't, and frankly, Army Corps wouldn't be in here if it weren't, uh, there weren't hazards to navigation. That is their uh, defining um, issue, if you will. That's why they're here in the first place. They, mm -hmm. they are dredging federal navigation channels to congressionally approved depth, width, and length, if you will. Okay. Thank you. And so now we'll go to uh, Councilor Comments, and you can carry on with that if you'd like. Aren't <laughs> 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 you guys who came down out of the woods? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Councilor Roy, there. Councilor Comments, please. Um, as always, I'd first like to start with some condolences out to families of, of our residents who have passed away. And uh, the first one is Pam Hudson Fridgen. Uh, her, doc her husband's a, a chiropractor. That works here in Scarborough, Madeline Moss, uh, Barbara Williamson, and John Burke, who was a patient at the Maine Veterans Home. Um, I guess I think I've probably made enough comments just other than to say that I will provide, uh, I'll use this as my bedtime reading, and uh, there is some interesting data in, in, in the report, um, but it may help us, you know, make a clearer decision certainly based, based on things. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to all of the folks out there who have taken the time to send emails. Uh, if I did not return email, you know, make a return reply, uh, I'm, I apologize for that, but uh, there were quite a number of them, but I tried, and, and most all the counselors did, try to respond as much as we could as we tried to sift through all of the data. And certainly we have more of it available to us than, uh, than many folks. And, uh, so. Uh, we will hopefully come up with something that at least is a fair compromise and still allows people to bring their dogs to the beach, and I think that's the issue. If if we don't do some of the things, it may mean no dogs go to the beach at any time, and and we don't want that to happen. So we will work on our decision. We've got two more weeks. So feel free to email us further. Thank you, Councilor Holbrook. Um, I'm just going to ditto. 
mm -hmm. Judy's comments. Um, thank you for all the input and the emails. And again, I, you know, I'd like to apologize too if I didn't get to somebody. Um, it's an overwhelming amount of emails for pro, con. Um, the one thing um, I do want to just touch on real quick, um, this ordinance that we're taking up um, and the possible changes is um, solely for our beaches, and I just want to remind folks of that. Um, all of our public lands are still public lands. They're open. You have the opportunity to take your animals there, um, not to throw a property under the bus and have a huge influx of folks there. But Fuller Farm on Broad Turn Road, it's a large couple hundred acre farm, open space. You're more than welcome to take your dog up there off leash, let them run. Mm -hmm. um, so just, just a suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. And that's it for my comment. Just I uh, wanted to add one thing, too, is I think that at some point between now and next April, I think the council needs to have a workshop. We need to look at and be innovative about the enforcement issues, about the signage, um, you know, maybe need to get modern with some uh, sun-powered flashing digital signs. Uh, we, there's a bunch of things that we can do that are tangential to this whole issue that uh, keeps it in check. Yeah. Yeah. Just, to, just to answer your question, your question was the uh, places we could take our dogs. Um, I, one of the goals that we've talked about recently as a, is, is a council is try to identify f maybe four properties or more in town, town-owned property that we can open up as dog parks. So that's something that's high on our agenda, I think. We've talked about it. And I think Out of the workshop. To yeah, and the workshop yeah. about it. And so we're going to pursue that. And yeah, that's a good question. Thank Sorry. you. No, that's fine. Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, I just, um, I only had one thing tonight. Um, I've had a lot of questions um, during the week um, about a uh, letter put in the leader on the Scarborough Downs um, change, the district, the change on the uh, zoning and that we voted on tonight. The, a lot of people are under the impression that the town, the council here, is taking away their right to vote on whether to have a casino here or not. And that is absolutely not true. Um, everybody uh, in town will have an opportunity to vote again on it if, if needed. Um, that, that is a um, given right to us to vote as many times as we want on something. And we voted many times on other um, other situations. Well, uh, just recently, marriage equality, we voted on that many times. We voted in the past as far as back as on Maine Yankee, I don't know how many times. So that's not a legitimate argument in my book. So uh, we, we uh, as a town, can vote on it again. So, and and everybody's going to get that right to vote if it comes up again. So no one's getting a vote taken away from them. Thank you for clarifying that. Councilor St. Clair. <laughs> I, I think I said probably enough tonight, but I thank both you and Tom for the extra effort that you're putting into it. I think it's a confusing issue. Um, it troubles me. It bothers me. Um, so I'm hoping that we can come to a resolution that is going to help everybody in the situation. It's clearly a com very complicated thing, more, far more complicated than I originally thought it was going to be when we first started discussing it. So, thanks. Thank you. Council Blaze. Uh, just one comment to answer your question. We got an email earlier today from Barb Bellicos that mentioned that uh, Fort Williams has got a yeah. off-leash dog area. So, another place to go. Councilor Benedict. First, also, Old Orchard Beach does. Oh, they do have a dog park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's right by the beach on the right-hand side. Yeah. <coughs> I happened to be in Florida and came across a dog park that gave me one big laugh because the sign on it is real clear. Bark Park. <laughs> <laughs> got a four-foot fence all the way around. It's got a uh, 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 thing that disposes the baggies, so you got no excuse for not picking up your own feces, dog's feces. It looks like it works good, and it's right in the middle of a ball. So they are out there, and we do have things to look at. That's number one. Number two, um, 
I want to ditto Councilor Sullivan on no one's vote is being taken away with the uh, uh, Scarborough down. Downs. And through the years, there's been numerous things that we've all voted on more than once. Minds change, life changes, the town changes. So if we're not doing anything. Still has the right out there. And the third thing that really aggravates the Dickens out of me is in some of the emails that I received, these people now are, were all adults, supposedly. And within these emails, everybody seems to be concerned about the police and security on the beach and this, that, and the other thing. I don't think it's just me. There's a time in your life where you're going to stand up and take responsibility. And if it means that, you, that you've got to tell the person next door to stop whatever, you got to do it. You, this depending on somebody else, you know, we're becoming a society of rules instead of a society of people. And you want the police to do this, that, and the other thing. They're undermanned, undermanned or womaned. And in my knowledge, I don't want police spending time chasing dogs on the beach. Now, a volunteer collage of people, that's all well and good. But I don't think that we should have the need to employ the police to do something that should just be automatically done. You don't see a cop in every store, but stealing is still illegal. Somehow they have a way of confining it. You know, we're not talking about DWIs here. We're talking about your own dog on the beach. And I wish people would think more about stepping up and taking responsibility on their own instead of trying to sidestep it, make it more than it should be or less than it should be. We've gotten indicators what they're looking for and why. We haven't got to the bottom of it yet. We are not in total agreement. We're not close to that. But we need everybody in on this. I mean, I had one email today that basically said, us against you guys. That is so far from the truth. I'm not here to aggravate anybody. Just here to conduct business. And I wish people would, would understand it and instead of taking it as such a personal vendetta. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> In the end, I hope we can, and I think uh, Councilor St. Clair said this, or somebody said this, I hope we can come up with a fair compromise, and I think that that's, uh, uh, Councilor Roy said that, that's uh, um, certainly our goal. Um, there's a lot of things going on, Councilor Benedict, you're right, I think education, uh, the VIPs, um, all that kind of stuff will probably come into play, you know. We've got to use a bunch of different resources here to make something work. And we're committed as a council to make it work. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, I, I wasn't here at the last meeting I was working, but um, Alfred Bell passed away, who was a longtime uh, Scarborough a resident, a lifelong Scarborough resident, and certainly his family, we all know in the community, certainly Bruce is here many times. Uh, and Bruce is, and Alfred at one time was a reserve police officer in this town. And that whole family, uh, whether it's Jack, Bruce, or Linda, or all the kids and grandkids, um, participated in town government somehow. They were volunteer firefighters or reserve policemen or whatever it was. And uh, Alfred was the kind of guy that always worked. Uh, he was my neighbor, uh, Judy Roy's neighbor and Jessica's. And we all knew him. He all worked two or three jobs, three or four jobs, but he always had time to give a little back to his community. And he raised six kids, six kids. And uh, he, he was quite a man, and he certainly is going to be missed by all of us. So I just want to send my condolences and the council's condolences again to uh, the Bell family. Um, he, was, he was quite a character in this town, that's for sure. Um, 
And last, and I just want to say something about the emails. I do get everybody's re emails, and I do read them. I get your letters. Uh, I am kind of frustrated by the people who send emails or, or, or letters to me, and there's no return address on, or they don't sign them, or I can't find the people in the community. We got two uh, tonight. Yeah, we got two tonight, and they're not signed. No we, address. We kind of toss them, you know, because. For whatever reason, they don't put their names on them. But uh, I do appreciate the emails and the letters I receive. I do read them. I'm not as good as other people getting back to you um, with a response, but you can be assured that everyone is looked at. Uh, and I think other than that, Tody, you had something to... Yes, uh, nomination papers were due in today was the final day, and we do have a slate of candidates for the town council. We have Ronald Alquist, Jean Marie Caterina, William J. Donovan, Carol S. Rancourt, Judith L. Roy. For the Board of Education, we have John W. Cole, Jane S. Ling, Jody L. Shea. For the Trustee to the Scarborough uh, Sanitary District, we have Seth Garrison, David Nelson, and Herbert Waldron. And for the Portland Water Trustee, we have Seth Garrison and Robert McSorley. And the election is November 5th. November 5th. And absentee ballots will be October. sometime in October. I believe it <laughs> okay. Is. Well, we won't hold you to that. We'll, we'll have it posted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's great. Terrific. So, other than that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Good night, everybody. Thank you. We're adjourned.